Well, welcome to this video where we're going to dig into Isaiah 40 verse 12 to 31 together. If you are new to my channel, I encourage you to subscribe so that you'll get notifications when I post new videos. Um, many of my videos are digging into Bible passages that I've been working in, preaching through. And this one in Isaiah 40 is part of a series where we're just focusing in on God. And we're looking particularly in this section at the reality that God is great. This section in Isaiah 40 um, comes after a whole lot of uh, messages about judgment on God's people because of their sin and rebellion against God. But then Isaiah 40 is a turning point where God says in verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people. So God is telling his people that he is about to do something about the problems that they're facing. And in this section, we see God showing that he is a God who is worth trusting in. He is able to fix the mess that the world is in because he is the great God, the immeasurable God, the incomparable God. So as always, I'm going to highlight just a few things that have stood out for me in this passage. There's lots of questions. What we're looking at here is God is helping us to see him through his eyes. And it should change how we see everything else. But these questions, God says, who has measured? Who? Who, who, who? And in these questions, particularly the first few, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? No one other than God. Um, verse 13, who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? The answer is no one. No one can enlighten God. No one can teach God or show him understanding. And as we go through these first few verses, it gets to the point where he says, with whom then will you compare God? And the obvious answer is no one. Our God is so great in power that he is absolutely incomparable. And we see he repeats that idea again in verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Verse 18 is a bit of a transition verse between what we see in the first few verses and what is to come, where verse 19 to 20 we see them setting up idols and we see the foolishness of idolatry compared with the incomparable greatness of god verse 25 and 26 again show the incomparable greatness of god god is showing in these sections that he is in a class of his own. Uh, nobody can compare to him. He is the Holy One. Holy means set apart. He's in a category all of his own. Now, he is the one who brings the starry hosts out. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And just this idea of him calling forth each by name is an incredible thought. There are more stars than we can count. And this is saying that God calls forth each by name. So the focus very much in this section is God helping us to see him through his eyes. And he wants us to see his greatness. He is the everlasting God. And he's so different to us, which the last few verses highlight, which we'll come to in a moment. So in these two sections, we see God spelling out the incomparable greatness of who he is. You just can't compare him with anyone else. And then verses 19 to 20 just show the foolishness of idolatry. And the results of living with disregard for God, um, 
God is saying here, listen and shudder. He is so great that if you set yourselves up against him, you are in a very dangerous position. So these verses where he focuses in on, on an idol, an idol being something that is fashioned or cast or a skilled worker has to set it up so that it won't topple. All of these things are showing the foolishness of idolatry compared with this incomparably great God who measures the waters in the hollow of his hand, who measures the heavens with the breadth of his hand. He is just incomparably bigger than us. And then people go and set up idols and worship them. They make them with their own hands. It is just absolutely crazy. And then we get this repeated phrase. So verse 21 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? We see it again in verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, Come on, guys. Haven't you heard about me? Don't you know about me? Don't try and find something to compare me to. And these verses also show the foolishness of actually living with disregard for God or, or thinking that you um, are actually something great compared with God. He's saying all the people are like grasshoppers. The princes and the rulers of the world are nothing compared with God's greatness. He blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. It's the idea of the, even the power of God's breath is incomparably bigger than we could even comprehend. And after Isaiah paints this massive picture of God's greatness, in these last few verses, he again calls us to listen. But this time, to listen and hope. And he's speaking here to people who are tired and weary, people who are weak, people who feel like they might faint. And one of the key things that Isaiah wants us to see is that we have this incomparably big God. He is a God who we should be lifting our eyes just to look at his heavens, to, cre to, to try and comprehend how great he is. And he is the God who has all power. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He won't grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. You see here in verse 26 it says, Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And in verse 29, he promises to Give his strength to the weary. But what kind of weary? That's where we need to just see a key idea in this verse. It's just mentioned once, but it's a big thing for us to hold on to. It's those who hope in the Lord or those who wait, as some translations might say, who wait on the Lord. He will renew their strength. You see, we are people who grow tired and weary, but God will never grow tired and weary. We don't always understand things. His understanding no one can fathom. We desperately need him to strengthen us in our weariness. And he says that those who hope in him, he will renew their strength. And actually it'll be a supernatural strength, an unexplainable strength, a strength that will enable you to, it's picture language, but to soar on wings like eagle and run and not grow weary and walk and not be faint. See, God promises to give us supernatural strength to make it through this life. But in order to make it through this life, we need to lift our eyes from the realities that surround us in this life. Not to get bogged down in what we see down here on earth, but actually to lift our eyes, look to God, and place our hope in Him. He is incomparably great. It would be foolish to place our hope in anything else. 
Now, as we teach this, our own hearts need to be rejoicing in this great God. But we also need to be honest with ourselves, asking God to expose the idols of our own hearts. And as we teach others, we want to be helping them to do that too. Um, Helping them to ask God to help them see what they are worshipping apart from Him. What are they looking to, hoping that it will give them what only God can give them. God is the only one who can give strength to the weary in a way that really matters, in a way that will get us through life this side of eternity, a life which is tiring and wearisome. We need to be people who hope in the Lord, the people who lift our eyes to the heavens. That's a command in this section. Lift your eyes. There's an action there. It's not getting stuck in looking at just what's happening around you in your own life, but rather looking to God, delighting in Him, longing for Him, living for Him in His strength as you hope in Him. See, God is more beautiful than you could ever imagine, and we need to see Him through His eyes, and then that changes how we see everything else. As you dig further into this passage, I hope that it will just cause you to stand in awe of God. He is incomparably great. To whom will you compare God? No one. We can't compare him to everyone, to anyone. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. And the more we think of him, the more we comprehend him, the more we look at his glorious creation, it should make us stand in awe of him. So that when we look to the heavens and we ask who created all these, our only answer can be our great God, the God who we can hope in. And our hope in him is sure as New Testament believers, because we know that Jesus came the incomparable God who can measure the waters in the hollow of his hand, who can mark off the heavens with the breadth of his hands, that God came. He came as a man, and as one Christian song says, these hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. God came to secure our hope so that he could fully and forever give strength to the weary, increase the power of the weak. We need to stand in awe of this God, living for him, loving for him, loving him, seeking to make him known. Well, God bless as you dig in further.